Good evening. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, my name is Bob Greenspan. I have this very pleasant job of chairing the board of the afternoon. I want to welcome you to the second uh, of our guest lectures tonight. <clears throat> we're in for a treat because we're going to get an insider's view of Silicon Valley in a way that uh, I, I know I'm looking forward to hearing. Uh, there's a great deal of symmetry in, our, in tonight's speaker because, uh, as many of you know, who come to these uh, lectures, our primary um, benefactors are Chuck and Nan Geschke and their foundation. And Chuck, uh, with uh, his partner, founded Adobe Systems over 30 years ago. Uh, I don't know about your computer, but mine doesn't work at all without the latest Adobe Systems up, uh, up uh, date. So uh, in terms of developing a company that became fundamental and um, enduring, uh, Chuck did that. And I know uh, Jay Ryan, our speaker tonight, is going to uh, talk a, a little bit about that. Uh, Ajay is truly a, a, a man of the world. He uh, was raised in India in Abu Dhabi, and then at age 15, I believe, uh, moved with his family to Toronto. Uh, he entered Yale University at the tender age of 16, and uh, after graduating from Yale, ended up uh, pretty quickly on the West Coast, uh, where uh, after a few different things, uh, he uh, became a, a friend and uh, investor with Peter Thiel, Peter uh, was one of the original uh, Facebook investors and one of the founders of PayPal and, and other things. Uh, Ajay uh, was involved with Clarion Capital with Peter and about three years ago started uh, Mithril, which is uh, his current um, uh, focus. Mithril is a very interesting uh, company that invests in uh, long-term growth technology companies. Uh, and Ajay's uh, going to talk a little bit about how Mithril is distinguishing itself uh, from the uh, other investors in that regard. So I'd like to, uh, this is Ajay's first time in Nantucket, uh, so I'd like to uh, join uh, with me in welcoming Ajay Roy. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Bob and uh, and Claire and the board of the Athenaeum, as well as uh, Chuck and Nan for having me. This is a wonderful place, and I uh, love the setting, so thank you for having me here. Um, so I'm going to say a few words, uh, maybe over the next 40 minutes or so, and then I'd love to open the floor up to questions. And the intention here is really to talk about what's been happening in Silicon Valley the last decade and some. Um, there is, if you, if you just go by the word count, you know, uh, referencing technology, in the New York Times, you would think that almost anything and everything worth happening in business is happening in Silicon Valley. Um, and so there's a, there's a little bit of, a, a great deal of focus on technology these days, but there's not a lot of, I think, common understanding of what's happening, why it's working, how you should think about it, and frankly, what's not working. So uh, all of those are interesting to learn about and, and, and frankly, to think about rigorously today and going forward. So I'll talk a little bit about the history of what's happened there in the last uh, 12 years, and I think that, or 14 years, and I think that matters because in 2000, there was a relatively cataclysmic event in Silicon Valley where the stock market crashed, and, and literally one third of uh, the market capitalization of the NASDAQ uh, fell into the water, almost like an iceberg that had just broken off, and, and people were shocked. And, and the funny thing about that point in time is if you were someone who was very optimistic about technology, you lost a great deal of money. And ironically, if you were someone who was very pessimistic about technology, you also lost a lot of money. Um, so, so the war takes no prisoners. It just killed everyone universally. And, and that was because those who were somewhat bearish uh, ended up being bearish a little earlier than they should have been. And those who were bullish did not stop being bullish before they should have stopped. So uh, bubbles, uh, which are generally a code for an indeterminate optimism about something, it's when, when you know, you've decided collectively that there's a better future and it's, it looks like this and we shouldn't question exactly how it works or why it works the way it does. We just have to try and get on the train. Uh, that's, that's generally what causes a bubble or bubble-like behavior. It's, it's the behavior of crowd thinking. And, uh, and that definitely did happen in the late 90s. So we'll start our story back then. And why that's interesting is uh, that was before I, I went to San Francisco. I was still an undergraduate while 
this bubble was gathering steam and was about to pop. I was at Yale. Um, and it was interesting because I'd come to New Haven in 1996 um, at the at the beginning, pretty much, pretty early into the Internet 1.0 boom. Um, and I had come from growing up in Abu Dhabi and in India, where we had just had a stock market boom uh, between 1989 and 1993. And if you remember, that was the end of the Cold War. There was this period where Francis Fukuyama told us that history had ended. Uh, we were all going to reap the dividends of the end of the Cold War. Uh, two or three billion people were going to rejoin the global economy and the market system. And, and the correct way to make money for that entire decade of the 1990s was uh, to go long globalization. So, so you would, if you were a, uh, a vice president at, at a, a white goods manufacturing company, you were making ovens and fridges and so on and so forth, the, the smart thing to do was position yourself to sell to Eastern Europeans and Indians and Chinese and Brazilians and all the other people that were going to be able to afford the things that you took for granted. So that was the, a decade-long plan that started pretty much in the late, late 80s and went for quite long a period of time. And that meant that we could afford to think a little less about doing new things at home because we could take the things that we already did and, and try and you know, spread the good word to the rest of the world. Um, and that also manifested itself in the financial markets. You had this, this, uh, this if you thought about the 1980s, the, 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 the uh, iconic investor of the 1980s was Peter Lynch. Uh, everybody had the Peter Lynch book. You bought the, the core kind of uh, companies that drove the American economy, Dow Chemical or General Electric, things like that. And then by the time you fast forward from 1985 to 1993 or something, uh, it was this gentleman, Mark Mobius at Franklin Templeton, uh, iconic investor. The idea was go, go global, invest in all these emerging markets. Um, and having grown up in one of those emerging markets, I saw firsthand what happens when a ton of money shows up at your doorstep and people don't have a very strong idea of why it's working or not. They just want to be there. And that happened to India between 89 and 93. And 93, the bubble popped. So, and you knew that it was going to pop, small anecdote, not directly relevant to Silicon Valley, but uh, archetypically uh, analogous. So in, in 1992, uh, I was 12 years old, and um, I was already somewhat investing in the stock market with my dad, who introduced me to this whole scam. Um, <laughs> now, he was an engineer. He was doing God's work. But um, I, I got interested in the stock tables, and then he said, if you care about this, the only way um, you'll learn is by having skin in the game. So uh, he lent me $100, and that was the beginning of, uh, of, the, of my investing career as such, such as it is. And, uh, but what I learned very quickly that uh, fundamental analysis was somewhat irrelevant to what was going on in the markets when people were highly motivated in one direction. And, um, and the irony was, um, you could apply to participate in IPOs, so initial public offerings, as a common person, as a retail investor. You didn't have to be a Wall Street insider or a stockbroker or something. You could be just a normal person and apply for allocations of stock at an IPO when these Indian companies were going public in the early 90s. And a number of people did. And so they started speculating in, you know, because they, were, they had direct access to these markets. And there was such a, a powerful story of resurgence and growth about the economy. Everyone believed it and everyone started buying into it. And people uh, in my extended family who had never heard of the stock market two years previously had very strong views on which company was going well and which CEO was going to announce strong earnings the following month. And then the other, you know, I, I grew up in the Gulf and we would go back to India every summer and spend two or three months in various parts of the country. And, and so you had the benefit of seeing things episodically so you could see year on year how people had evolved or, or regressed, as the case may be. And so right around the end of the boom, um, you had sellers on, on the street, who, you know, hawkers, who would sell you lottery tickets for state lotteries, various Indian states. And these lottery tickets were printed on very thin color paper. So they were yellow and pink and red and things like that. And you would buy them for, say, you know, 50 rupees or something like that. And with no irony, uh, in the 92, 93 period, they would sell you stock market tip sheets that were printed on the same tissue thin paper and contained um, you know, quotes from the, the, the market savants of the day who, who would have you subscribe to high-priced newsletters, but they would have copied 
illegally, you know, tracks from those newsletters, reproduce them on lottery ticket paper, and would sell them to you for the same low price. So, so that happened, and then a year afterwards, everything blew up. And I learned a couple of lessons through that with my little, you know, portfolio, which had been doing very well, mind you, through no fault of my own. It was just that the market was just appreciating. So I learned that um, the macro, you know, as the bigger picture matters. No matter how good you are at research and stock picking and so on and so forth, you could get mugged by Mrs. Market when you least expected it. And so you could get taken all the way up, so you think you're doing really well. Everything went up at the same time, and then everything came down at the same time. So that, that was a lesson about the importance of macro. The second lesson was the importance of micro, that the specific details of the companies you invested in actually mattered a lot more for the long term. So while the bubble is going on, you're in a macro reality. Everything is going up and down at the same time. But longer term, um, the, the fundamentals catch up with you. So you actually do want to focus on the fundamentals. So everything went up, everything came down. And then the few companies that did very well that were the ones that were fundamentally better assets, durable businesses. So that was an early lesson. And this is before I showed up in New Haven, you know, as, as, as Bob put it, at a tender age of 16. I felt much older then, but in retrospect, I was 16. Um, so I show up in New Haven, and the party's on. It feels just like India three or four years previously, except there was this thing called the internet. And everybody was starting a dot com. And you had that same indiscriminate, indeterminate optimism about the whole phenomenon. And I realized at some level that this was a substitute for thinking rigorously about what would work and what would not work. That you could just join the party, buy yourself a ticket, and you'd be OK. Um, and so I kind of stayed out of it because you know, I'd seen the movie at least once. And then the other thing I noticed was venture capital as a phenomenon itself was uniquely American. Uh, I'd never heard of it growing up outside the United States. It was a very American thing. It's a very powerful tool to have a group of people who are willing to finance very risky new ideas that you know, more traditional institutional investors uh, would not. They would, they would find it uh, you know, too dangerous and their, their stakeholders would not support it. So that was a uniquely American thing and it attracted some of the world's great innovators to come to this country and start businesses to be sure. Uh, but I also realized that that was a cottage industry and it had been a cottage industry for a long time. So you looked at the most prominent firms um, in the venture capital firmament and they were generally two or three partners who were prominent, maybe four or five, and then they'd formed a partnership, they were investing together you had one or two interns or associates uh, who might get promoted eventually, but it was not like a Goldman Sachs or a McKinsey or any number of those more standard Wall Street type um, organizations that were larger institutional, had a pyramid structure, training programs and things like that. So at one level, it meant that uh, it was a very elite profession. It was hard to get into. At another level, it meant that it was very idiosyncratic. It was driven by the, the vicissitudes and the biases and, and, and uh, kind of native uh, ideas of those who were running these small partnerships. And, and so concomitantly weird things were done. You know, interesting companies were funded, things that would otherwise never have gotten capital, um, got risk capital. If you fast forward just five years through this boom period and fast forward to say 2001, the stock market had crashed and the bubble had come to an end. People were feeling somewhat depressed about technology, they weren't feeling hopeful. And um, meanwhile, many of the largest and most storied venture capital partnerships had metastasized. They'd become much, much larger. They had become billion dollar partnerships. And you suddenly had you know, ranks of analysts and associates and so on and so forth in some of these firms just as the bubble ended. And what that meant for a lot of young entrepreneurs who were just, um, or technologists who were thinking about doing new things in Silicon Valley circa 2001, 2002, 2003, was you, you actually had very well-funded investors who had raised capital through the boom period, but who were very reluctant to invest in new things. Uh, the, the crash had shell-shocked, had this shell-shock effect, and people were unwilling to try new things. So that was the, the time when I actually ended up going um, to San Francisco, uh, and I went there because I was living in Canada and Toronto, and mutual friends introduced me to this gentleman, Peter Thiel, who's now, who's become a mentor, friend, and partner um, in my business. And he had just, you know, at the ripe old age of, I think, 33 or 34, 
um, he had just sold his first company, and that company was PayPal. And if you remember PayPal, that was uh, a late 1990s phenomenon. It was started in 1998 in, in the form that we understand it to be today, which is a network for emailing each other money, really, or sending each other money by some means, secure means. And it was the first real company to get that right. Um, and he had sold that company to eBay uh, in, in, in 2002. Around, uh, just brief aside, it was the first company to go public after, um, after the, the tech crash. It went public in 2001 when people thought, OK, this, this whole thing is done. And then PayPal actually came out and declared itself for the public market and then got sold to eBay. So it was at that time that we met. I was thinking about starting a company. He had just started, built, and sold one. Uh, I was 22. He was 34 or so. So we became friends over mutual interest. And he said, you should come to San Francisco and do this. That's the place to try something new. Uh, they're not afraid of young people. They're not afraid of new things. Um, it's a little bit different on the East Coast. You should try this. So it was good advice in retrospect. It was also really good advice because, uh, I mean, I'd been waiting until 02 because I wanted to wait for the end of, a, uh, of the bubble period because it was so expensive to hire people and so expensive to live in San Francisco or try any of the things that I wanted to try. And when I say I, that's someone in my position, a young person trying to start something new. By 2002, 2003, that had moderated quite a bit. Another interesting aside as to what had happened by then, by 0203, is the internet became possible. And, and I think Chuck would kind of chuckle at this and go, wait, we had this back in 1978 and maybe even 68 with, with ARPANET and, you know, and then all the foundational technologies for the internet existed well before you know, what people like myself or you know, Mark Zuckerberg or Peter Thiel would consider the internet today. But it was really the promise of the internet could be fulfilled at a whole new level because we could all take broadband access to the internet for granted. And that wasn't possible in the late 90s. If you remember, we all had modems. We had those early 90s, you had the uh, you know, uh, 2400 baud dial-up modems, and then it, you, all the way up to 128.8 kind of baud modems. It was still a dial-up modem. You heard the, the scrunchy sound, and it tried to connect with the internet, and then you knew that it was online. Uh, and then you got America online, and it said you got mail, and, and they made a movie about it. And so that was, that was, that was, the, that was the internet back then. And, and if you look at a number of the, uh, the companies that we take for, for granted today, and we read about in the newspapers, companies like Uber, companies like Airbnb, companies like, you know, e even the modern version of PayPal or the modern payment services and so on, um, many of those delivery services, all of these things, they were all the business plans for all those companies almost every single one of them, weirdly, existed in the late 90s. And, and those of us who were following this phenomenon, we, we saw all those plans and we tracked the entrepreneurs trying to start these companies. But you did not have ubiquitous high-speed access to the internet. And the interesting thing, just as a historical note, is, is the intervening period saw this great um, boom in, 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 in investment and in infrastructure in, uh, for broadband. You saw this fiber optic revolution. You had all these companies that uh, were telecom companies that raised billions of dollars of capital, all the way from Enron to you know, WorldCom and MCI, Tyco, MCI, WorldCom merged, uh, Tyco, and so on and so forth. They all went bankrupt in the early 2000s. But if you think about it and you go back to an earlier period of history of this country, uh, the previous industrial revolution, say the railroads, you had a similar boom in the investment uh, into the underlying infrastructure to make continental, transcontinental railroads possible, to make uh, you know, ubiquitous logistics and delivery, the US Postal Service, all of these things possible. You had previous generations of quote unquote overinvestment in infrastructure and then a process of bankruptcy, recovery, you know, the, uh, and, and kind of rectification of the situation. But the fruit of that entire painful period was that people could take for granted a piece of infrastructure that became ubiquitous and, and norm, you know, um, uh, just part of your normal daily existence. So that happened to the internet in the 1999 to 2003 period. While we were not looking, while we were all worried about you know, the end of the dot-com boom, and we were worried about what was happening with the bankruptcy of all these companies that, were, that had become famous quickly, uh, the internet happened as we know it. 
and a whole new generation of entrepreneurs showed up. Many of them were still in college, and perhaps like previous generations of entrepreneurs, that was the place they had access to broadband before. You know, you had to pay, I mean, they didn't have to pay hundreds of dollars per month to access a high quality internet connection. And computers were getting cheaper, and they still are. So if you think about it, computation has gotten cheaper over time. Um, the access to bandwidth has gotten more ubiquitous and cheaper over time. Uh, store, both the ability to store large quantities of data and perform computations on, on larger quantities of data have become commodity utilities over the last decade. And this process had begun towards the end of the last internet boom. And the first generation of people to take advantage of this right afterwards were the, like of, were the likes of Mark Zuckerberg. And ironically, um, they were also people who couldn't find any venture capital funding, circa 2003, 2004. And, and the Zuckerberg story is now well known. Uh, there's been a movie about it where everybody seems smarter and meaner than they are in real life. And that happens when you get the Aaron Sorkin filter. Um, so, and, 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 but but the, the, the lesson from that period was uh, you could try new things that would cost you 10 times as much to try just five years previously. So if you were starting Facebook in 1998, you would probably need you know, a lot more capital your customers would not be able to reach your service except by dialing up and going through AOL or CompuServe or something like that. Uh, you just didn't have, you couldn't take for granted the things that Mark could you know, by the time he started the company. There are a couple of points about that, that Facebook phenomenon itself that can illustrate what we have learned about what works and what doesn't work among technology companies in the last decade. The first one is that he wasn't the first person to start a social network. So there is this uh, standard idea among both people in Silicon Valley as well as people who think about technology that there is a very strong first mover advantage inherent in, in doing things in tech. And the funny thing is not one of the most prominent companies either in Peter and my collective investing history or in the world of uh, prominent internet companies, not almost none were the first precisely of the current generation uh, leaders were the first to do what they what they are now known for doing. So Google was not the first search engine by a long shot. I mean, if you remember, there were, there were such stalwarts as Excite and Alta Vista, and and remember that Yahoo portal that you used to land in and you know click through ten catalog, you know lengths. I mean depth of catalogs. Um, gone. Google remains. Uh, Facebook was not the first social network. Preceding Facebook, you had Friendster, you had MySpace, you had Orkut, which was very big in Brazil and India, for example. Um, you, you, had an, uh, you had a number of fair-sized social networks. The idea was known before Facebook came on the scene, and the last of its generation is Facebook. It survives. PayPal, same story. You had payment networks preceding PayPal, but PayPal kind of was the last company of its generation. So this is, is true also of Amazon when it comes to e-commerce. So there's, almost in every category, um, it's less important. The, the standard ways of searching are go look for the first mover. And if you miss the first mover, then try and get into the fast follower, the guy who looks just like the first mover, but has figured out some of the mistakes that the first guy's making, and, but it's cheaper to buy into. Um, so. You know, that's, that, that's what people go for. The problem is first movers seldom get it right. And I'm not saying you shouldn't invest in innovation. What I'm really saying is you should try to figure out who's picked the right market or the right approach to the market and then built a product, built a solution to that problem inside a product that can scale. So if you take the Facebook phenomenon itself as a case study, uh, precisely the reason it was so difficult for Facebook to raise capital early in their lives, as, as Peter has told it in his stories before, because he was we were he was the first outside funder of the company, and so you know he, he would tell us about this live when he was doing this investment, um, was the fact that Zuckerberg wanted to build a service for university campuses. So people in Boston in the venture capital community basically said it feels like a small market. It, it doesn't. That was not the only reason against. Facebook at the time, but this was a big reason he couldn't get funding. It felt like too small a market. And venture capital has historically had a preference for entrepreneurs who go after large markets. 
the problem with going after large markets, it turns out, is competition. Because the law of numbers attracts lots of people who want to come and try their luck. So if you say that I want to connect the entire world into the world's biggest social network, well, there's going to be lots of people who aspirationally want to try and do that. It sounds like a really sexy, cool idea. Uh, the problem is that uh, it's very difficult to differentiate yourself if you're competing with so many different people and you end up losing or you end up spending a lot of effort for very little um, value. So by going after a much smaller market, um, he had very little competition because what do we all do in a network? I mean, if you think about this entire internet thing, at the end of the day, it's about building better networks. This room is a network. It's a live mesh network of human nodes. And these are, we're all living nodes, members of the network. We're connecting as we speak. And what we do in a network is uh, we get informed, we interact, and we transact. And that can take on many forms and direction, degree, and preferences. Uh, it can be the end of an interaction, could be a job interview, it could be you know, um, a marriage proposal, it could be lots of things I mean, that happen at the end of an interaction within the network. And we are, we are all members of many social networks where we have these rich uh, experiences. And that's what Zuckerberg was trying to infuse online. That's what all the social network pioneers were doing. But by choosing the college campus, a couple of things happened. Uh, that had nothing to do with technology and everything to do with the choice of market and addressing those markets, market needs in product. One, um, the way in which people connected on campus was through email listservs at the time and through the college bulletin board and the college newspaper. And when Facebook entered a given campus, they had 80% market share within two weeks of, of coming onto a single campus, right? So 80%, it was just viral. People wanted to be connected. The second thing, which was not obvious at the time, uh, but made sense, and I think Mark had very clear views about this, was, was getting the network set up with real identities. It was brilliant. Because previously, if you think about MySpace, which had hundreds of millions of members at its peak, and then just blew up, um, you would have people with random handles. They had, they had an internet name, a MySpace name, so kitty cat 223, is that your grandmother, your daughter, your high school coach, the pedophile across the street? We don't know. Nobody knew. They all looked the same online. You could dress it up to look how you wanted. Whereas if you needed a .edu address to get online, to get onto the network, well, Harvard made sure that you were a real person. And it was a small thing, but it made a huge difference because we tend to do more in a network where we know the other people and we have confidence in who we are dealing with. So it was a subtle feature, but that subtlety made all the difference between a low impact, low interaction network and a high interaction, high fidelity network where people did more with each other and for better reasons, right? And, and so little things like this is what made Facebook unique. If all he had done, if all that Facebook had done was take over college campuses in America, the company would probably be worth a billion dollars. But they did much more than that. By starting there and allowing people to invite those, you know, once they had the campuses, they allowed people to go incrementally beyond in concentric circles. Because one fourth of, or actually 50% of his target market was interacting with the real world every year. A class was coming in and a class was leaving in the undergraduate universe. So not only did you seed the network with real people and real identities, but they left and went into the real world or they pulled people in from the previous class in high school and they connected them into the network as well. So you spread from campus to campus virally and within five years or so, you had pretty much connected the entire world that had access to a broadband connection, right? So it, it, it gets into situations where having grown up in Abu Dhabi, I had a pretty eclectic group of people I grew up with nationalities wise. And there was a young woman I knew um, who was a Shia Lebanese of Shia Lebanese extraction. So she was a practicing Muslim. She's very modern, so you know, she'd wear couture and have a good life. Except uh, she got a, a phone call once from her grandmother in a rural village in Lebanon who was very unhappy. She said, I've, I'm on Facebook now. <laughs> and, and I saw the photographs. Not OK. And so she was, <laughs> so she, she's telling me this story. She's running a startup in San Francisco. And she's like, that's when I knew that this thing was global, is when my grandmother 
in Lebanon had a, had a phone with um, and her you know, 85 year old grandmother who speaks no English, only Arabic. And th this is the other thing about the internet is when you get it right, it is global, right? So um, people think that you know, when you compete, you could build the Facebook of Arabia, the Facebook of Europe, the Facebook of Brazil, you know, but the, in most categories, there are, there are exceptions, and it's important to understand the exceptions. Uh, but in most categories, the, it, what matters is building the global last mover uh, in, your particular, uh, in your particular market, right? So the Facebook, people thought they could build the Facebook of Persia as a separate product as a separate service, it turns out it's just Facebook. The Facebook of rural Lebanese grandmothers is Facebook. Um, so, it, and, and it doesn't matter what language, it's about how we connect, and we connect in so many rich ways, and they got that right in product. And the other, the point about, when I keep saying you should do this in product, what do I mean? What I mean is, uh, you can build great companies on a service model, where you're providing better service to people, and you, you hire more and more you know, customer service personnel, you hire people who answer phone calls or provide in-person, uh, you know, live experiences and so on. The, the problem with that, it's a wonderful thing when it works, and I love going to the Four Seasons, but uh, it does not scale the same way uh, as a classic technology company does when you get a complicated problem resolved in a simple fashion, create a simple experience for people that delights them in a product uh, that is universally accessible. And as you learn more about your market um, and the needs of your market, you can build solutions to those needs in the product itself by continually upgrading the product and, and not having to hire more people in the classic sense. And so your margins, the amount of profit you get to keep, remains the same or grows as a percentage of your revenues over time. So that is, uh, I think, an important feature of, of well-run technology companies. You know that you're running a technology company when over time you get to do more with less. Um, and, and you know, you could argue that traditional companies have to do more with more, technology companies you do more with less, and no matter what political persuasion you have, government generally entails doing less with more. Um, so, so that's it's just a fact of history history. So um, so that's that's the way I tend to think about these things. And so we spend a lot of time um, in the last 10 years, you know, trying to find people who are building companies like this and, and encouraging them early and then financing them through the, the most difficult periods of their growth. Um, and what's interesting is in the last five or six years, the rest of the world seems to have rediscovered Silicon Valley. They were very suspicious of Silicon Valley technology, venture capital in this, in this period between 2000 and 2007 when everybody decided to get two mortgages. And, and go be part of the housing bubble, and that was fun. Um, and then it kind of ended. So, so t it's sad, it, was, it hit all of us. But you know, I'm trying to make light of something that was really quite painful across the board. But it, that, that was the distraction. So if you, if you think about um, the last 30 years, so 1982, let's basically anchor this economic discussion at the end of the Paul Volcker era. So Paul Volcker comes along and kills inflation. So super important thing happened. And then Mr. Greenspan takes over and we have this 30 year period through, through the Bernanke era of, of the great moderation where interest rates consistently went down over time and you had booms and busts and seemingly normal economic cycles, but net net things just got, money got cheaper, money got easier on average. And anything that was tied to that phenomenon did generally very well. So at the end of the day, you could do emerging markets investing, you could do financial engineering in the US as a substitute for real engineering. Um, you, you, could, you could try a variety of different options, all of which did very well on the back of, you could even just buy 30-year bonds, treasury bonds, and lock them away. And you would have done very well in that 30-year period for very different reasons than the people who are toiling at the emerging markets. But at the end, mechanically, but fundamentally at the macro level, it was all being driven by lower cost of money, lower volatility associated with markets, and so on and so forth. And every now and then, um, that comes back to bite us and really hard, because while we're doing this, what matters is what we're not doing. We're not building new technologies. We're not investing in new markets or the creation of new markets. We're not forming new capital. We're basically trading existing capital with each other and, and building derivatives on top of it 
and feeling really good about ourselves. And then when the musical chairs stop every five to seven years, it feels, you feel the pain. So I would argue, uh, I get asked this question all the time. I'm sure it's on your minds and you're probably gonna ask me the question in a few minutes, is are we in a bubble in Silicon Valley? Because there's so much talk of tech, tech, tech. And I would, I would humbly suggest no. But I do think we're in a bubble. And I think the bubble is a, a safety bubble. We're afraid of the future. And if you see how that manifests in the financial markets, um, you would see that volatility in, in many of the markets is very, very low. People are, out buying, um, people are out buying government bonds like crazy at the same time as volatility being low. It's a very weird situation. People haven't figured out what to do about it. So my friends in the hedge fund industry are having trouble making money because they like volatility. And my friends in, 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 in the long-term investment industry are going, wait, you know, we want to get pension returns, but bonds are yielding nothing. So how do we get an income out of the situation? It's very weird. Um, and what that suggests to me is people are basically shorting the future. They're basically saying, we might, there might not be a happy tomorrow. So we would rather get 90 cents of our money back buying this German government bond um, rather than lose all of it. So we'll just lock it up, know that we'll lose only 10 cents and see what happens. So there is a lot of weird safety seeking behavior going on in the broader economy. And as a result, for the economists in the room, the real interest rate is in negative territory. So you, you, know, you, it's, you could argue that there was a, a bubble in nominal interest rates, which was highly accessible to the retail borrower. So everybody in this room borrowing for a house, you had you know, lower nominal interest rates you know, in, the, in the mid 2000s, all the way up to 2008. And then things have shifted where the average person, ironically, in an age where interest rates are zero, is unable to borrow. So you can borrow if you're Mr. Buffett, you can borrow if you're Apple Inc., neither of whom need the money, um, but you can't borrow if you're a working class person in San Francisco or Pittsburgh, uh, you have to go to alternative channels. So there is a weird phenomenon of a war on, on cash on one side, low interest rates, and there's also a war on credit after the financial crisis. And meanwhile, we're all basically protecting ourselves from the future by buying these bonds and hoping to hide underneath them. If you go to Silicon Valley, that's just the macro view. If you go to Silicon Valley, a weird version of this manifests, which is you have a lot of investors buying safety in optionality, meaning they're just buying a lot of options, a lot of lottery tickets. Not all investors, the best investors don't do this at any stage but you see uh, a significant increase in early stage companies being financed, not all of which are very good. And this has started to happen the last three, four years. And on the other side, you see uh, a, a, a great increase in financings associated with companies that are closer to going public. So companies that have fairly mature business models that are ready to go to the public markets, uh, where effectively the way public markets are set up today, it's very difficult to be a company in the public market limelight and do fundamentally new things. The market doesn't like that. It gets scared, it, it kills your stock price, um, and then the activists show up and tell you how to run your business. So a lot of entrepreneurs really don't like trying new things as, as people running public companies. They try to get that done with when they're private. So on the other hand, you see a lot of investors who've come into Silicon Valley who are investing just before a company goes public, two, three, years before a company goes public. So in both cases, on one side, it's safety in buying a lot of options, a lot of lottery tickets. On the other end, it's safety in crowds. So you see both of these phenomena. And what you're seeing less of, less than what we need, is actual old school venture capital, where the alchemy by which money gets transformed into risk capital is an alignment of time horizon, an alignment of mission, and an alignment of interests of economic interests. And that's actually really hard to get right. Uh, you need to, I, I, we, for example, we've, we've, we've had to do this live over the last three years as a firm. Um, and I've learned that it's very bad to read a business plan because, or to read a, a pitch book. Uh, when someone comes in with a pitch, it's like evaluating a person on the basis of their resume or match.com profile or something. It is necessarily a, an abstracted facsimile of the real thing. Um, it's, a, it's a truncated story. You don't really know the person until you meet them. So there needs to be enough to take the next meeting, 
and then what you actually do in the meeting is you set aside all this formal material and you say, what if we were invested? And what if we were having a board meeting? And this were the Monday after the investment. What are you excited about? What are you worried about? What's working? What's not working? What do you lose sleep over? Who do you want to fire? Who would you love to hire? These are questions that they don't talk about in the fancy pitch book. But these are the things that are keeping them awake. And how do you grow by a factor of 10, an order of magnitude, from where you are today? And by the way, do you think you're actually in the right market? Or should you change strategy? Oh, sounds like a dangerous question. Well, it's important that it be asked. And you might have spent three or four years building a company a certain way, but are there things that you learned in those three or four years? And are there things that have happened in the market in those three or four years that mean that you have a much better opportunity to create a 10 or $100 billion company by doing something slightly different? And are you afraid to talk about that with your current board of directors because you're running off of the business plan of five years ago? These are very real problems because I think most people are afraid of plans. They are afraid of making them for two reasons. One, very few people know themselves well enough to have a clear idea of what they want to do. And to the extent they put something down on paper, they're afraid of becoming prisoners of the plan. Um, I happen to think it's very important to have a 20-year plan, but you've got to be open-minded enough to update it every six months. So <laughs> I think it's the only rational way in which to have a 20-year plan. So, um, so that's, that's, it's a very organic uh, way of thinking about investing. And I think uh, given the world that we're in today, it's a world where the specific details associated with every company matters a great deal. You can't afford to invest in the theme. You can't say, I'll do everything that's you know, cybersecurity for the enterprise in the cloud. Sounds really good. You'll probably lose all your money. Um, because there's about 2,000 people literally trying to do this in Silicon Valley. How do you know if this guy is better than this person? You have no idea. So the specific details, each company is a sovereign emanation from its founder's minds in a moment in time. And you have to understand how these people came together, why they're doing the things they're doing, and what will happen if they get it done the way that they, they plan to uh, from a product market fit point of view and from a competitiveness point of view. Let me dwell a little bit on competitiveness. People talk a lot about the sexy nature of these companies and so on and so forth, the convenience associated with an Uber. But I think at the end of the day, when we talk about the winners, um, it's often in technology the case that you have a winner-take-all reality. You have it, you, you know, it is not this, um, it's a very steep logarithmic distribution where you know, the, 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 the initial the, the, the cohort at the left pretty much takes all the cream and then everybody else gets you know, crumbs. Um, so, so the competitiveness question matters a lot. And the reason I bring that up is because people talk about growth, 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 tech, tech, tech. Growth, weirdly, is easy to show. It has never been easier to show growth than it is now in Silicon Valley or anywhere else. Why? Because all the inputs that go into building one of these companies have gotten way cheaper. So smart people can raise $100,000 to $2 million and show you on a graph growth in the number of users, growth in initial revenues, number of pilot contracts they signed with important companies and they splashed their logos in the presentation. So, you know, I'm doing business with BP. And you call the guy at BP and it's like the 20th guy down from the top and he's never heard of them and he said, you know, kind of wrote a small PO and we'll see what happens. But that's a logo, success. And so there's death by a thousand pilots. There's, there's all kinds of, you know, early stage mistakes that are signal failures, where signals are, these, these are misinterpreted signals. And they're always signals about growth. I'm growing. And it's very, very dangerous to invest in that graph because most of these graphs are designed to show you a J curve. And the destiny of almost every single J curve is to turn into an S curve. Um, and the only question is when and what's the slope of the curve. And, and so the best companies, I find, tend to be the sum of S curves over time. They know that almost every J curve will become an S curve. They plan for it, but they use the first one to take ownership of a market, and then they keep reinforcing ownership of that market and product, and over time they own a franchise. 
So that's the difference between flow, where you just show growth, and franchise, where you have ownership of a market and a customer with whom you can do more over time without compromising your margins. The best companies are able to do the latter. So if you have to optimize, do not optimize for growth, optimize for durability. That matters a lot more. Resilience matters a lot more. And so when we had to pick, uh, well, we didn't have to, but we thought it would be fun to pick a, a tagline for our firm. We thought about the old Jim Collins book, Built to Last. And my only problem with that book, it's a great book, is the fact that it says built. It, it assumes that you're done. And, and so we just changed that to building to last. And I think the present continuous is, makes all the difference. You can't stop. You have to continuously iterate to stay competitive. Um, a point, I could talk a little bit about some of the companies that we see and the places in which people are innovating today. Uh, most of what you hear will be about apps. So, you know, and it is as it should be because the idea that you have a supercomputer in your pocket is kind of awesome. I mean, you know, this was just a fantasy about 10 years ago. It's reality now. So uh, people are building software for your little supercomputer. Um, but that being said, what goes on behind that has changed quite a bit. So you had the earliest iterations. You could think of PayPal as an app. You know, there's a mobile payment app. And that's happening entirely in the cloud. It's happening online. And then you have phenomena like Uber, where you're starting to connect offline infrastructure to online markets and demand networks. And that's happening in lots of different ways. And the point I wanted to make today is that you should not be looking just in Silicon Valley for these innovations. It's more likely that you'll find them there than elsewhere. But we're finding great companies in such exotic foreign countries as Kansas City, as Texas, parts of Texas at least, uh, parts of Canada that are not even Toronto, but say Calgary or Montreal or Quebec City. And so what we're learning, and if you go abroad, you know, it's not just places you can get to on a life flat bed, which is where most VCs go, but it's places like Munich and Toulouse in France and um, where else? The Battle of Hastings. There's a little company we've been looking at in, in Hastings, the Battle of 1066. Um, so there's not much else going on in that town, but there, there's a group of companies doing very interesting things in virtual reality and augmented reality uh, that come out of the... European defense world. Um, so th the point of the matter is you have to look globally. And because the enabling technologies that the app guys take for granted have started to affect just about every phenomenon, every industry. And the problem with the world, I think, is we tend to think of technology as such an exception. It's like that New Yorker cartoon, the view of the rest of America from New York. You have, you know, this New Jersey is really big and this flyover country. And, and there is an investment version of that cartoon where Silicon Valley is right there shining over the Golden Gate. And it's like a gold mine in Mongolia. You need to have an insider friend to explain what's going on. Maybe you'll get into the right names and you know, get away with the gold. Um, and there's, a, there's an element of 1849 that's very alive in San Francisco. Don't get me wrong. But, but that's, it's, it's dangerous to restrict yourself to that because the, the underlying truths of what makes that possible are such that Silicon Valley can be a state of mind anywhere. The reality of social networks uh, means that people who have similar interests are connecting horizontally, meaning all the people obsessed with nanotechnology to reduce coal emissions or coal stack emissions, they've all connected. Like all 300 of them globally know each other. So, <laughs> right? And so it, you had to go and find silos of these people in different countries if you wanted to invest in what they were doing but they've all come together now. Uh, all the people who want to print leather, you know, 3D print leather as an alternative to killing animals, um, they've all found each other. So there's this very interesting, you know, global phenomenon of, of the world shrinking. And, and, and it, I don't want to quite declare that we've regressed and gone back to a flat world or something, but, um, but there's elements of that that are very true. There's been a compression of time and space in, in in very specific singularities, you know, this super high interest in particular areas. And you want to find those people, and you want to find the people who are building truly valuable things, not just the groupies, because in every one of those, uh, in every one of those groupings, you have what I call this, the people who are, uh, who are subscribers to the, world, to the theory of rigor matters, and then there's just people who are enraptured. So there's rigor versus rapture. There's people who have decided they're in love with the future, and there are people who are doing something about it. And it's easy to, to, to confuse the two, okay? Because they look the same. They've all learned the patois of innovation. 
and they talk the same way, and they all start companies and try to raise money. But there's very few who are actually doing things that will work, so it matters that you listen to those people and try to find, you know, separate them from the others. Um, so, and, and, and the point is, it's, it's not just, so it's global, it's not just software. Software is clearly where most of the innovation is happening for the simple reason that it's least affected by regulation, it's least affected by external constraints, ex ante. So there's, you don't think about, okay, is the FDA going to stop me from doing this before you start? You kind of do something and then figure out the FDA situation afterwards, as Uber is doing in New York. Um, so you could argue if that's good or bad, but net-net, things happen, right? Just get things done. Um, the interesting thing is technology is now making it possible. It's lowering the activation energy to try new things in industries where previously you just didn't even bother. Elon Musk is a fantastic example of that, right? I think everyone here knows who he is. And, and cl in the classical sense, you would think this is a crazy person who's going after the military defense complex you know, in, with, with SpaceX and is trying to like, go after General Motors and, and trying to redeem the entire clean tech investment fiasco with, with Tesla. Um, yes, why? Because he's actually an embodiment not of the idea that you go after large markets, but that you go after specific markets with a specific technology solution and take over. Who thought that, I mean, if you took a survey 10 years ago, what would be the most successful clean tech company of the 21st century. Nobody would say that it would be a company making knockoffs of British sports cars that were powered by laptop batteries uh, being manufactured in an ex General Motors Toyota facility in Fremont. No, that's crazy. But that's Tesla, and it is one of the most successful, possibly the most successful clean tech company from an investor point of view and a returns point of view of the last decade. And the same. Uh, you would have had the same miss if you asked people who would get electric cars right. Because the classic uh, way of thinking about this was build a car for the every man. Build a middle class vehicle that everyone could afford. And there were so many approaches that, that wanted to universalize, that were evangelical and wanted to universalize this very early on. And the infrastructure you need to do that was forbidding. The companies failed. The technology was not mature enough. just didn't work. By choosing, I mean, by creating an initial spec, basically said, you know, uncomfortable 1960s British sports car that ran 120 miles, cost $120,000, that was for basically obsessed people who love new things or had too much money and wanted to try new things. Okay, slightly hilarious, but it worked. So, and you had a crazy waiting list, and the company got off the ground, and you had the room to iterate from that make it work, where you had a higher tolerance for, for failure, right? You had a higher tolerance for, shall we say, I hate the word failure, let's say high quality mistakes, okay, <laughs> along the way. You don't want to fail, but you want to learn from high quality mistakes. Um, and so you, he started doing that, and then you graduate to the S-Class, which is, or the Tesla S, which is basically a Mercedes S-Class price vehicle that's actually an Audi A6. But that's okay. People are willing to pay that spread for the electric car. And then you move down to a Toyota Camry, and then you go from there. That's happening, and it takes 10 years. So the other little secret of the last decade is it takes a decade to incubate a great company. Um, I was just talking to, to Chuck at dinner about Adobe, and it's an incredible idea that you could start a company and take it public in four years into the stock market from scratch in 2015. And you might argue we've regressed a little bit. I would argue that we've learned that public markets and truly innovative company building are, have parted ways a little bit. So if you want to try new things, if you want to build, break, and hack, you have to do that with room to spare. And the private markets are more forgiving of that idea. So that's, that's how, uh, so that's what, that, those have been some of the lessons of the last 10 years. The way, last point I want to make, uh, it's just, or I'll just finish the point I began about five minutes ago, which is that this is starting to affect a variety of areas, not just software. It's, it's surgical robotics. We have investments in surgical robotics. We have investments in computers that are made of bioengineered yeast that can be used to accelerate the discovery of antibody drugs. We have investments in um, a nuclear fusion company. And the most interesting thing about this nuclear fusion company is that 
of the materials that go into their fusion reactor, they buy on Alibaba.com. Okay? And that's because clean, you know, the, the electronics of the grid, of the smart grid, have become commoditized in the last 10 years. Another example of overinvestment, bankruptcy, and commodification allowing a next generation of, of innovation. So I would basically say be patient, have a plan, be very, very focused, keep changing the plan if you must, but have a plan. Pick a market that you can own and then expand you know, concentrically from there or into adjacent markets. Try to build a monopoly in your core market. Love your customer and own them. They'll reward you with loyalty. That's how you build a franchise. And don't restrict yourself to, to software. And yes, since you can't afford to start a company in a garage in San Francisco, do think about doing it in Chattanooga. I'm going there in two weeks. So <laughs> I'm open to questions. So. Oh, sure. And it, it seems preposterous uh, with the valuation of the company and their strategy of losing money to 2020. Right. So I'm just curious where that fits in in our bubble. Well, um, so the question was about this company, Jet.com, that just launched um, you know, to compete with Amazon, and they've raised a great deal of money. So not, not to have a specific view on the specific company, but on this phenomenon of what I call foie gras investing, where you have a huge amount of money stuffed into a company before it's time. Uh, I think not very good. It might be tasty for the short term, but it doesn't make for a franchise. I hope Jet wins. Okay, it'd be good to have more competition in e-commerce. Uh, but we're starting to see more companies raise much larger quantities of cash early on. Um, and that is a part of that indeterminate kind of safety bubble. So I would say if, you're, if you want to invest along with other smart people, then there are very few names that you can just get into. And, and those few names attract more than their share of dollars. So I think at the edges of the system, you will see overinvestment um, in, in, in just a few companies. So you could say that that's a manifestation of the broader bubble is the point I wanted to make. So what I want to say about the bubble specific to Silicon Valley is this. For the, to understand the contrast between the last time we had a bubble in Silicon Valley and now, I would simply ask people, especially any young people in this room who are still in college or about to go to college, because you, you have no living memory of this. Um, there's this thing called the SEC. They have a website, Edgar, OK? And they have these S1 filings, which is what happens when you go public. I'm looking at this young person crowd in the back, OK? And you should read the S1s that were filed by companies going public in 1997, 98, 99. And you will see the valuations they achieved and the stock market performance they had after they went public relative to the numbers that they posted and the maturity of their, relative, of their businesses relative to the companies that are going public today. So yes, at the extremes of the private market, you have overinvestment in a few darlings. But at the same time, I would say structurally, there's underinvestment in building new things across the board. And the, few, and the companies that are doing really well the Ubers, the Airbnbs, the Palantirs, the, I mean, the companies that are known for being leaders in their fields have very substantive uh, metrics um, and, and, and are building stronger franchises than were ever the case in the 1990s. So there's a relative element to this. Um, and there's also a question of where the bubble-like behavior is coming from. I would argue it's coming from outside the tech industry for the most part. Uh, certainly all the new money comes from outside the tech industry. So please. So the question was, interest rates are supposed to go up. How will that change the, the reality in the valley? I think um, two things will happen. I think people like us who are very focused on staying long-term investors in the valley, the idea is really to build a Berkshire Hathaway for 2030 or 2040. What would that look like? What assets would you anchor that to? Uh, we would not change our behaviors. We would, just, we would probably have better investment opportunities uh, in the world that we focus on. I think there would be uh, a lot fewer people investing in the later stages of these companies, that we now have a lot of mutual funds and hedge funds, uh, and frankly, even private equity funds who used to be in the business of buying industrial companies and turning them around, who have established growth platforms and who are investing in Silicon Valley. Um, and they've all decided that the sweet spot is where they can get a you know, 10 to 50% return, maybe a 2x if you get lucky. Uh, in companies that are just about to go public, uh, maybe two years out. And I think the pool of capital that would do that 
uh, will migrate to better opportunities with higher interest rates elsewhere. Um, that being said, uh, without taking on the mantle of a soothsayer because they generally get killed in pretty much every historical tradition, um, I think it would be hard to raise rates for the foreseeable future. I mean, numbers are not adding up. We don't have any, we don't have as much real growth in the economy as there should be to make things, you know, to signal more strength. If you think of rates as signaling strength, I don't think we're strong enough yet. That's, that's tragic but true. Um, please. Uh, yes and no. I think that uh, the yes part has to do with all the mechanical elements. Can I send you money easily? Um, yes. Can I arrange to borrow from a peer? Yes. Uh, the reality, though, is that the financial system is still heavily regulated. And so, and that's, you could argue about the merits of regulation, different types of regulation. The good news is that most of the regulators we have met are somewhat constructive about what's happening in Silicon Valley, and they want to get to know what's going on. The, the bad news is they still have a lot of power ex ante to stop things that have happened and prevent things from happening. So uh, at the end of the day, there is a structural barrier to entry to try genuinely new things. Why have we not seen a new SWIFT, I mean, which is the, the, the payment system, the, the interbank payment system that's used globally? That's been around for about 45 years or something. It's like a World War II post-war phenomenon. Nothing new has happened. I mean, these banks still use telex codes. They just send it over the internet. Um, and so there's something very wrong with that system, and I think it'll be very hard to reform banking until we can shift that around. I don't think it'll be as easy as saying Bitcoin. I mean, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to scale that for the time being. Uh, the other point about financial technology is that there is, unfortunately, very little technology in fintech. So if you think about phenomena like the Lending Club company, very successful company doing yeoman service in the world where average people are not able to borrow from the banking system. You could argue, is that a success of Lending Club or a failure of the banking system and policy? Open question, essay question. Um, so, but, but, the, uh, but at the end of the day, you, you think it's peer-to-peer -peer lending. It turns out it's hedge fund-to-peer lending because you know, hedge funds are not making enough yield in the real world, in the financial market. So you could expose some of your money to these, to these online lending platforms and pick up 20% 20, 20 of yield a little higher risk, but that's part of the deal. So you could, you, there's some level at which this is not necessarily new tech, but um, so it, it, the short of it is super hard to, to do anything new in money and banking, um, even though there's a lot of buzz about it. Oh, sorry, you had a question. Uh, I had a question in terms of strategizing with companies. You talked about Ryan Young for a strategy of growth, going more for a strategy of resiliency, and sometimes uh, we try to be very growth oriented to try to scale, which is a bit more aggressive approach to spending more money. While resiliency, in my kind of, and it's one word, you know, there's a lot more. Sure. Stuff. You're kind of being a bit more conservative. You might be building a reserve. You might be building greater stability. There's kind of a juxtaposition there of strategies. I, I, I'm more familiar with the growth, which is what's in all the private equity. What, what's your growth? What's your multiple? What's sure. Your risk, yeah. Versus resiliency. It's just an interesting concept. I just didn't know if you elaborate. I'll elaborate. Actually, it's an important question. So the question was, I, I've talked about the importance of resilience and durability over, over quote unquote growth. And I think uh, it's, a, it's a question of semantics, but it's important semantics in this case. Uh, the, the kind of growth, uh, the kind of resilience and durability I'm talking about is taking ownership of a market. So if you take a company like Google, uh, they have such overwhelming dominance in the world of media that you know it's effectively you could, you could argue it's something of a natural monopoly. I mean, it's not a gerrymandered monopoly where you know, five Japanese food additives company executives got in a room and decided this is what you know, a particular ingredient will cost you. It's, it's more that they just so clearly dominate their space um, that it's very difficult for anybody else to compete. And so when I say durability, I'm talking about focusing almost relentlessly on identifying the, the market in which you can have that type of ownership. Um, and then the quality of growth changes completely because what I would be afraid to invest in is a company spending a lot of money early on to show me better and better numbers, but just if they step off the accelerator, the numbers don't, don't uh, sustain. So the sustainability, the resilience, the turbo effect of feeding the exhaust back into the engine and going faster and faster, 
comes from picking a market that you can own and doing more with that market over time. So it's the, it's the idea of spending money on building a franchise versus spending money on increasing flows in a company that actually has no franchise value ultimately. So I would, it's, it's a second order question is you can show growth and you can show growth. So you want to anchor to a company that's building you know, a, a really valuable franchise and then turn on the growth by investing a lot more capital, which we do all the time. Almost every one of our companies, uh, I said tongue in cheek, one of our investors said, what would qualify, I mean, how would you describe your entire portfolio if you had to use one word? I said unprofitable. And, and then they're shocked. They're like, you're asking me to invest? I said, yes, because there's, a, there's, there's two types of unprofitable behavior. There's one where you've built a bad business and you're going to die. And there's another one where you've built such a great business that the rational thing to do is to drive every dollar in your hands back into growing the company because every alternative is worse, right? And you should raise more money from other people and put it back into growth. So those are the businesses we want. And you can only justify that if you have franchise value. So that's what I meant. So. Yes. Technology and opportunity and venture capital. What do you see over the next uh, 20, 30 years? Is that likely to change? Are we going to lose our franchise? If uh, I were a, a bright young engineer, where would my best opportunity be? I think if you're a bright engineer, bright young engineer, your best opportunity is still here. As, uh, for the moment, it's still true. I don't know how long that will stay true, and we're certainly making best efforts to kill the golden goose, uh, but the goose is still laying eggs, so that's the good news. Um, the, I mean, I'm on a science advisory board at Oak Ridge, and people have forgotten about that place, Manhattan Project, and I like nuclear power, and so I spend some time down there every year. Um, and the last time I was there, they, sh they had this project for where they, were, they have a center for additive manufacturing, which is basically 3D printing at scale, okay? So, um, and they open it up to regional community colleges and high schools. So you have lots of kids building really interesting projects um, at, at this Oak Ridge facility. And the best one that I saw was uh, an entry into the DARPA robot competition. It was a basketball playing robot uh, that a bunch of high school kids had built. It was fabulous. It did amazing things. Uh, but there was one unusual feature. There was a prominent sign in Mandarin on the side. And I thought, was this like a collaborative project with you know, some delegation from China, what, what was the deal? And they said, no, no, the kids did this because we had a uh, PRC, official delegation visiting, and they wanted to make a statement. So I said, well, what does it read? Made in America, <laughs> in Mandarin. <laughs> so, so there's hope, there's, there's people who want to try new things. Uh, the things that militate against that is, is, is safety seeking over risk, you know, over intelligent risk taking. So you don't want to have dumb risk taking, but you want more intelligent risk taking. You want more room for intelligent risk taking. We've been really good at that as a country. I mean, this place was a whaling station. That was an early form of risk. Um, but we've been doing this for a long time. And I hope we never stop. Um, certainly, I mean, my family moved to Canada in the mid-90s, and I couldn't do what I've done or what I've been able to do. And I'm still trying, but it's a work in progress. But what I've been trying to do in Silicon Valley it's much harder to do in Canada, which is just as good a first world country. We, you know, we, we can, you, you don't have to get an international driver's license when you cross the border. Uh, you know, so, but you know, it's, there are certain things that the culture of the United States is uniquely suited to try things that uh, you can't elsewhere. Uh, so you, you certainly don't want to change that risk-taking culture. You don't want to subsume that risk-taking culture into risk theater which is what happens when people start doing derivatives and financial engineering instead of real engineering, um, and a whole host of other things where we substitute theater for the real thing. And you don't want to create barriers to entry that are artificial. And I would argue one of those barriers is formal credentialing. So it's not about whether you should go to college or get a particular professional credential. It's about functional outcomes versus um, outcomes that are validated within the cathedral. So there's a, we, over the last, you know, 300 plus years, we've developed a very sophisticated um, you know, institutional system of learning and uh, professional credentialing and so on. Net, net, it's been very helpful. But it can also, I think we should recognize, be a barrier to people trying fundamentally new things. 
certainly really young people trying new things who can't all access a college education, who can't all, and so we, we have to remove this caste system that says that you can't be really good at something unless you have a degree. This is not to say you're anti-college, it's simply to say, let's just say that we shouldn't discriminate against those who don't get to go to college, and also give more opportunities for people to learn useful things outside of the cathedral and, and have the opportunity to, to manifest it in enterprise. So that's, that's also part of what makes us great. I don't think half the great investors had degrees. I mean, inventors had degrees. I think half the great investors did not have degrees either. So that's a different question. But anyway, so that the long answer to your question, hopefully helpful. Please. Yeah, I mean, theoretically, Google could try and kill Uber or something, right? So there's, uh, there's talk that they were friends and then they became frenemies and maybe they become enemies and stat is unclear. Um, so this could happen to anyone. I think the, the idea of choosing the right market matters more than anything else. So if you choose a big market that's easy to, where there's lots of competition or where the big companies, where you need scale to survive. So let's put it that way. So suppose you need scale to survive and have a viable business. Then it's more likely that the successful iteration of the business you'd like to start will be done by a Google or somebody with a large user base who can experiment at low cost in trying new things. So it would be better to choose a market where you're doing something very specific for a small number of people. So that raises the threshold of success. So you need to do something really valuable, 10x better than the alternative for a small group of people. This is not about disruptive innovation. So I want to make that point. Like most people talk about disruption, disruption. Disruption is immaterial to people starting a small company. It's only important for people running big companies who are afraid of small companies. That book was written for the Fortune 500. We need to worry about crossing the chasm, right? The other book, Jeffrey Moore, that's a more interesting book. You should read that book. Choose the right market and then you know, land and expand. So, so that, is, that would be my advice. And then the second piece of advice, what we've seen works, is just get going. Um, you want to, you have all the infrastructure. People ask me, should I hire five people? Do I hire engineers in Estonia? It's weird stuff. And I was like, look, <laughs> do you have friends? Do any of your friends code? Okay, do they believe in you? If the answer to any of these things is no, there's a problem. Like you should go find those people and become friends with them. And then just start, test, iterate. So it's the build, break, hack idea. And you've got to do that in scale. So that, that'd be two cents. Sir? So the question is, do I uh, subscribe to a theory that Facebook will someday become another Google because of its dominance? I think, I think every one of these companies has uh, something like a 20 to 25 year run as a, as a dominant kind of apex predator, if you will, in the system. Uh, Microsoft, really kind of an 85 to 2005 Windows Vista came out, and then that's kind of the end of, okay, that was it. Um, I wouldn't say Microsoft is done, I'm just saying people stop talking about them as a growth company. Right, so Google is coming upon its 20th anniversary. That was 1998, so it's gonna be 2018 soon. I'm not saying Google's done in 2018, I'm just saying it's been a hell of a resilient business model, right? So, and Facebook is young, so it's younger by a decade. Um, so, and they have more room to try new things and absorb more new ideas. The purchase of WhatsApp, the purchase of Instagram, that was very prescient. It, uh, the purchase of Oculus, very prescient. P every one of those purchases were discussed in terms of the amount they paid for it, but people focused less on the capabilities they got when they bought those companies. With WhatsApp, they got 400 million people in the rest of the world using basic smartphones. I mean, uh, with Instagram, they became prominent with using pictures to communicate, which is how we all use our phones these days. That's the primary thing we do. So these things matter, and I think Facebook is a long way to go. In the same period, Google has had a very resilient core franchise, but they've had a few missteps in trying new things. They just retired Google Plus. So uh, there's a bunch of things they tried that didn't work as well. Um, I think they'll ultimately be a large ongoing internet utility company and that's not going to change for a long time in the same way that Microsoft has been around a long time. But I think in terms of doing fabulous new things, 
it's an open field. It's much more open a field than it was 10 years ago. So I, that would be my semi-diplomatic answer. <laughs> Great. If we may have time for one more question. I'll let you pick, Bob. I'll let you pick. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, uh, okay, so that's a very important question. The question was, we've all seen technology solve first world problems, get your grocery delivered, you know, have your car parked. Somebody was talking about a, a valet app in San Francisco, Lux Valet. Uh, guy comes on the skateboard, parks a car, drives away, brings it back to you. It's kind of cool. Um, so, <laughs> can't do that in Mumbai. Just keep getting run over. <laughs> so, <laughs> the... The, but that being said, in all seriousness, uh, you don't want to get, I don't want to get all Reaganomics about this. It's not trickle down. It's universal. So Facebook is a universal utility. It's not a trickle down utility. It's not, you know, my friend's grandmother in, in Lebanon did not get to use Facebook after everyone else got in and it was like the cheaper version. She got the same deal as everyone else. Um, there are companies in our portfolio today, the, possibly the most socially consequential company in our portfolio will be a company called Fractal, which is based in Waltham. And they're building a, um, a, a device that ablates your duodenum, your small intestine. There's a nine centimeter section of the duodenum that they ablate. It's like laser skin resurfacing for your gut. But what it does is it improves, uh, as of now, A1C levels for those who have type 2 diabetes uh, by, by a factor of two. So it goes from, you know, two by two percentage points. So it goes from, you know, say, uh, nine to a seven reading. And if you have diabetes, you know that that's a very serious improvement. So that's the difference between 14 medications and four or two or something like that. And people get hypoglycemic after they go through the treatment, which is great. So to me, it's innovations like that. And that's not an app. You can't appify that, right? And, and that's not getting nearly enough funding because it's not a sexy biotech drug. We're used to healthcare innovation being black box things that are wonder drugs that take seven years and a billion dollars. This is a device. It's developed by a cardiologist out of Brigham. And, and he found that those who had bariatric surgery had significantly improved outcomes in their diabetes. And he started to figure out why. And that investigation led to a discovery of a hormonal signaling pathway from your small intestine. And he started to hack that signaling pathway by resurfacing the gut. Uh, a seemingly simple observation that could have massive consequences for 400 million people today and counting. So that's almost like a diabetes, I wouldn't say vaccine, but it's a very significant treatment. Uh, we're only now trying it for people who have advanced diabetes, but we might be able to extend it to becoming a preventative treatment in the future if the numbers hold up. Um, the antibody discovery company that I talked about in Dartmouth, it's, it came out of the Dartmouth bioengineering department, okay, not necessarily Silicon Valley. And they've bioengineered yeast, baker's yeast. That's the secret sauce. They've changed the genetic code of these baker's yeast to replicate the immune response of human beings. And so they have specific human beings whose immune responses they've replicated. So they can test the yeast instead of testing uh, on a person uh, well in advance of when they would be allowed to test on a person. And it's a lot more accurate than testing on a mouse model. So if we can accelerate the discovery of useful antibodies by a factor of years uh, in many cases, then you start to create life-saving medication a lot earlier we were also able to help with the finding of a vaccine for the Ebola outbreak, because uh, it's the same thing. You want to, you know, so that's a part of what we did. We got blood samples from the doctor who, you know, was uh, on the New York subway and, and then hospitalized. Um, and they just announced a vaccine was created. We did not make the vaccine, obviously. Other more talented people did, but we were able to help. It's an enabling technology. And you have too few of that in, in healthcare. You have too few of that in, in energy. And, and those are the areas where uh, getting it right will have universal value. It's not, you know, it doesn't discriminate. And neither does Facebook for that matter. Connecting people has had a huge effect. You create capital when people can touch each other and do more with each other. You start selling things to each other. You exchange services. People in the Philippines tutor people in India and vice versa. So I would argue that this generation, aside from apps that help you park in San Francisco, which we were just talking about at dinner, have a universal appeal and value. So I would say do more of that and do it across the board. Thank you.
Cool. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, David. All right. Thank you.